Friends, please be seated. Okay, let's hear it for our readers today. Woo! <laughs> Not only did they they read it, read our lections so beautifully, but wow, look at those lections. Uh, kudos to you, Karen. You, you, you took some deep breathing to get through that one. And the excitement and, and exuberance uh, with which John uh, prayed and led our psalm today. That's how you pray a psalm, all right? I love it, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People bringing their gifts, pre people bringing their, their talents and who, fully who they are to the worship of God, I would say A+. Plus. So today we're celebrating uh, the Trinity, the mystological kind of um, expression of the Godhead. Um, but I think it bears asking the question, have you ever seen God? Have you ever seen God? Have you seen the face of God? Trinity Sunday that we celebrate today invites us into a realm of imagination and a, an expanse of our consciousness to stretch beyond our earthly realities and begin just to see a little bit of the bigger picture of God's awesome reality. It is thoroughly theological today, but it is also utterly relational. Remember that theology is the work of how we think about God. And the concept of the Trinity, as mystical as it most certainly is, it also grounds us, it grounds our thinking about God in terms of relationship. The fundamental characteristic of God, along with being love itself, is God's Trinitarian form, a loving community of three in one, a circle of mutuality, interconnectedness, and inclusivity. God offers us a model for being community where the celebration of diversity and unity are not mutually exclusive, but are quite the contrary, the essential truths of our universe, of our species, and our church that we, like God, are one. Now you get the point, and the point is the God of love demonstrates for us love in myriad ways, but always in relationship with God's self and with us. To think about God is to think about the nature of what it is to be related of interdependence, of connectedness. That means, my good Episcopal friends, we never do it alone. We're so good at that. I love it. That's why we have a common life. That's why we share a common, a book of common prayer, because we don't do it alone. And I love that Jesus in our reading today, this morning, he promises his disciples that he will be with them always, even to the end of the age. He's saying in essence, listen guys, here's the deal. I still have many things to share with you, but there are some things that you're just simply not going to get. But don't worry. There will never come a time when I will abandon you. I will never, ever leave you. Now these disciples, these best friends and buddies of Jesus who've been with him from the beginning have more to learn. They don't have all the answers. And by design, they will continue to be dependent upon Jesus even when Jesus ascends and leaves them in body. They will continue to depend on him, depend on the spirit of truth who will come and dwell within and among them. 
And they will be dependent upon one another because the Spirit will speak through each of them because everyone gets to contribute a verse. Everyone gets to be used by the Spirit of God because the Spirit will speak through them, through the people in the world around them, interdependent, interconnected upon God and one another. So when the Spirit of the living God would come and rest upon them on that mystical and utterly practical first Pentecost, they would experience being in the midst of God's own mystical and beloved community. But their experience was not one of having all the answers or even understanding having a mystical understanding of the divine community of the three-in-one. They didn't sit down and write a doctrinal expression of their essential faith. No, we would do that three centuries later. No, they participated in a relationship. They participated in a community from whom the blessings of mutuality, interconnectedness, and inclusivity flowed. And a community grounded in God's own life as a place and a people who didn't have all the answers. A place and a community and a people who didn't have a prayer book, they didn't have a budget, and certainly didn't have a building. But a place and a people who made space for conversation a place and a people who made space for inquiry, for wonder. A place and a people who valued diverse voices, experiences, and perspective. A place and a people who discovered genuine community together in messy, challenging, creative, productive, and life-giving relationships. It would become what the beloved community would call a place and a people called ecclesia. Ecclesia. The called out ones. The church. The church. Not a place of certainty or infallibility. Not a people who have all the answers, even when they wear a collar. Not a place where all the people worship the same way or even believe the same way. Certainly not a place where they all agree. But a place and a people who walk together in uncertainty and through adversity. A people who know the love of God in their own hearts and experience the God of love within and among them. Church, ecclesia, the called out ones, is a people who are known by their love for one another and by their love for the world as God's own beautiful, messy, diverse, and interconnected creation. Dallas Willard, my spiritual hero, once described God's aim in human history as the creation of a community of all-inclusive, loving persons with God included as its primary sustainer and most glorious inhabitant, community. There was once a little girl in Sunday school who was consumed by drawing a picture. The Sunday school teacher asked what she was drawing, to which the little girl answered, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, nobody knows what God looks like, said the Sunday school teacher, to which the little girl replied, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> Perhaps we don't know what God looks like. 
why not even Moses could see God face to face and live. But we can see God's face reflected in the faces of those we love. We can see the face of God in the faces of those we serve, in the faces of our brothers and sisters for whom we advocate and affirm, in the faces of our children and our elders. In church, we must see God in the face of our enemies and our adversaries, in the faces of those we don't understand, but we must first begin with ourselves. Can we see the face of God in the mirror, in our own faces? Recognizing the face of God in our neighbor's face is predicated upon how well we recognize God in our own. Think Jesus' teaching to love our neighbors as ourselves. And how doing that is predicating upon loving ourselves first. You cannot give that which you don't already possess. Our love of neighbor is based on a presumed love of God first. And from our love of God flows our love of self. And that is based on our value. And our value is based in the one who built us all with purpose for unconditional and unreasonable love. And this kind of love is not based on what you've done or what you merited or what you've left undone of what you've said or not said. It's not based on who you love or how you vote or whether you attend church, mosque, or temple or whether we attend anything at all. We are loved because God created us for God's self out of love. In all of humanity's diversity of expression and beauty and life, it is love itself that unifies us and makes us one. God's love supreme unifies us all. So we must learn to love God. And we must learn to be loved by God. Then we must learn to love and be love ourselves. Only then can we learn to love like God and love our neighbors as God intends. For first we were loved, now we love. St. Patrick's, to be a part of the community of love that God is inviting us into is to be a community that looks outward, not inward. The kind of community who bears witness in the world to love and peace, the peace of God in Jesus as we experience him, even when it means that we don't have all the answers or know what it's all about the kind of community who respond to the needs of our neighbors without thinking, the kind of people who seek to transform suffering wherever we encounter it, the kind of people who make space for conversation, who affirm and love people who are different from us, who live and love and believe differently than we do. We are called to be a place and a people whose highest value is love expressed in relationship. The kind of place and people who are called out to love the world as God loves the whole world. The kind of place and people that God calls the called out ones. 
what we call the church. That's what God looks like. And that's what we must strive to look like too.